Welcome to the Book Show, a celebration of reading and writers. I'm Joe Donahue. Pulitzer Prize winning author Richard Russo's new novel, Somebody's Fool, has Russo returning to upstate New York and to the characters that captured the hearts and imaginations of millions of readers in his beloved bestsellers, Nobody's Fool and Everybody's Fool. All three make up the North Bath Trilogy. Russo grew up in Gloversville, New York, which bears a striking resemblance to the fictional North Bath, a town near Schuyler Springs, the spitting image of the resort town, Saratoga Springs. So it made perfect sense to be at the Spa Little Theater in Saratoga for this week's book show, taping before a sold-out audience to discuss Somebody's Fool. Richard Russo is the author of nine previous novels, most recently Chances Are... Everybody's Fool, and That Old Cape Magic, as well as two collections of stories and the memoir Elsewhere. In 2002, he received the Pulitzer Prize for Empire Falls. Richard Russo was given a hero's welcome as he returned to his home region. Welcome home. Thank you. That's exactly what this feels like. That seems like it could be lovely. Mixture of joy and sheer terror yeah yeah that's 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 interesting yeah i've had the great honor of of interviewing you many many times for many novels over the years and doing events like this with you and i love them so much and one of the things i i know is that just when i when i think of when i first started interviewing you to now you seem much more open about talking about Gloversville, North Bath, and this region than you were. I mean, there were a point where you hadn't been there for a long time, sort of almost estranged from it. For a while, going back to Gloversville was very strange, despite the fact that I still had a lot of family there, a lot of loved ones there. Part of it was that when I started writing about it, those first few novels, I began to um, change things about it, of course, as you would. You have to imagine. You can't just take things. Um, And you imagine. And when I was writing those first three novels, I started changing things. And with each book, I changed it more and more and more, changed the geography to the way I wanted it. Um, and, And then when I would go back, people had moved things around. You know, and, and, and it, was, it was irritating because I, moved, I, I put things exactly where I wanted them. And then I would go back and they would go about their lives as they had been doing before. This town was growing in its specificity and its vividness. My Mohawk, my North Bath. I put them everything exactly where I wanted it to be. And, of course, when, then reality. Every time I would come back and there would be reality. But the other thing which was probably more important than that was that when I was growing up, my parents split up when I was young. And I went to college um, uh, at the University of Arizona. My my mother really wanted to get me out of Gloversville. She was determined, in fact. We went to um, the University of Arizona where I began to speak kind of a different language. It was like entering the witness protection program there. And she had certain... certain, um, certain things that she wanted. She did not want me to be a writer. And when I announced my att- intention uh, to do that, she was very chagrined. She, she had in mind for me to be, uh, to continue in the witness protection program um, and to be an English professor. So she didn't take kindly, that kindly to that, to that particular notion of, uh, that I had now of, of, of being a writer. And I think that, honestly, Joe, when I came back, um, I couldn't quite reveal myself because I had been in the witness protection program for so long. And, and, and coming back, and, and as, as you say, my being more open now um, than I was as the author of The Risk Pool or Nobody's Fool, it's just a feature of, of time and growing older and being more open And I think each of these fool novels has allowed me to become much more open. I I mean, the second one took me, that was over 
two decades before I decided to come back to North Bath, and then came back much more quickly for the third book. But no, I think that's, I think that more than anything else, that's what it was. It was the conflict between, between the way my father was when he returned um, to upstate New York and, and made a home, um, and made a home here after the, after the war, my mother's determination to, to get me to leave and then come back in disguise. You know, and it's, so really, I'm, I'm just, over, over the years, gradually, I've learned that it's okay to take off that disguise. Do you think it is, and maybe I'm reading too much into it, but my sense in reading this novel is that the disguise, even since the, the last full novel, that the disguise is, is fully off. And not only is the disguise fully off, but there is also... You're, you're giving yourself an allowance to move things around to where they really are now. You, you acknowledge the great change. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, I think this time things have, with, with each of these novels, also things have gotten progressively darker. Yeah, this, this time coming back, it was, it was, a, it was a wonderful homecoming. But it was, of all of the three full novels, this one was by far the most difficult to write. Well, I could ask this simply and say, why was that? But if I was guessing, it's because your main character is really a ghost. That's true. This particular series of books has a number of ghosts. Miss Burrell, who dies at the end of the first novel, yeah. is a ghost-like presence for Officer Raymer, certainly in the second book, and even indeed in the third one. But she was a ghostly presence. Her, it's, this is her house that Sully has inherited. And that house, which is so central to, to all of these North Bath novels, is very important in the book. Sully never, of course, expected to inherit it, but he does. So there's, in the first book, Miss Burrell comes back and, and, and is a ghostly presence throughout Everybody's Fool. And now, of course, Sully is a ghostly presence in this book. There's also the fact of Peter, which I will bring up now, because Peter is one of the central, that is Sully's son. Peter is, is one of the central characters in, in this book. And going back to a little bit to what we were talking about before, if I go back to Nobody's Fool for a moment, of all of the characters in that, that book, and, and those of you who have read my Fool novels know that I really do fall in love with these people. I, I enjoy their company. I wouldn't write about them. These books take me about four years to write. I don't like being in the company of people who bore me, either on the page or in real life. And so I spend a lot of time with people who entertain me. My father, who Sully is based on, was one of the most entertaining men I have ever run across. And all the people in his world, once, once I was old enough to occupy a bar stool next to his, I began to appreciate him, understand him, but I also got to meet all of his friends and began to in, inhabit his world. But in the world of Nobody's Fool, the one person that I could not warm to was Peter, which I suppose is interesting in the sense that that is the character that if Sully is my father, right. that makes me... The, arith the arithmetic here is, is inescapable, and I'm sure, that, I'm sure that, it's a, that it's occurred to all of you as well. But I simply could not warm to that man. I couldn't warm to him when he came back with his family at the beginning of Nobody's Fool. Sully's walking along the road, and this car pulls over, and a guy gets out of it and asks him if, if he needs a lift, and so, Sully doesn't even for a moment recognize his own son. But even from that, from that moment when he arrives in that novel, and then throughout the rest of that novel, and, and really throughout Everybody's Fool, I just could not warm to him. And the reason for that was, of course, that he too was in that same witness protection program. He, too, had gone away. He, too, had learned a different language from the one that he spoke on the, on the, on the streets of his home in, in North Bath. And he came home 
with, um, with an armor. He was wearing an, a kind of armor when he came home, and that armor was built of irony. He had a kind of shield that he was always able to put between him and the world, a way of blaming other people, especially Sully, um, but other people too, for the, for the fact that he was unwilling to really share much of himself. And the thing that I'm so grateful for in this third Fool novel is that I was finally beginning to warm a little bit to him, to myself. <laughs> I wouldn't say, it, I, it sounds like I'm, I'm describing somebody who was full of self-loathing, which is, which is not the truth. But what happens to Peter in this novel, I don't want to ruin it for you, but as in all good novels, the important characters all have arcs. And the arc of Peter's story in this book is very satisfying to me, as I, as I hope it will be to you, because I think, without revealing too much, that, that armor, that ironic protection that he has used to keep him distant from his father, from various lovers. There's, there comes a certain time in your, in your life, I think, with, with most of us, that we have certain tricks, we have certain ways that we navigate the world, and sometimes it's just almost like a switch gets flipped, and you suddenly realize that what's been working for you for a long time just doesn't work anymore, and now you've got to deal with something new. Richard Russo is our guest in this week's book show. We are at the Spa Little Theater in Saratoga Springs, New York. Somebody's Fool is the new novel, and it is published by Knopf. The richness of all of these books, this world that you have created and continue to add to, at what point did you say, okay, this, this, this should do it. This, this will be the last one. Well... Tolkien. <laughs> <laughs> Let's blame him. That's sure. Fellowship of the Ring, The Two Towers, uh, Return of the King. There's, there's no fourth. <laughs> the, story, the story's finished. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but no, honestly, I don't, I don't know that for a fact. I mean, I said that. I said that about Nobody's Fool. I had no intention of ever going back to North Bath again or ever resurrecting these characters. I thought that their stories, the story of all those characters in Nobody's Fool, I thought that their story was resolved, only to discover that, um, finally, that by going back again, the only reason that I did that really was to, was to enjoy these people. Um, they were entertaining, and I thought they might entertain me again. It gave me a chance to spend some more time with my father, because I got cheated out of a lot of that. He'd he became ill not so long after I began to really um, get to know him. And so I went back, and then I went back again. But no, this feels like the return of the king um, for me. I, I just, right now, I mean, people have been saying, as I've been on book tour here for a while, people have been pitching me, pitching me a fourth full book, right? What I keep hearing um, from, people who have, from people who have read this book is that the fourth one would have to be about two of Peter's sons. Peter, you may recall, this book reminds you of, of the fact that Peter had three sons, one of whom, Will, he has raised. Right. And he's been a very good father to Will. Right. As a matter of fact, Will has paid... Peter back, and also his grandfather, because Sully had a great deal to do with making Will into the fine young man uh, that he has turned out to be. But Will is, in fact, a fine, fine, fine young man. And Peter, until this book, has every reason to think of himself as a good father, until at the very beginning of this book, or very, very near the beginning of this book, one of his other sons appears, a full-grown man now that he has not seen since he was a boy. Whacker, he was called then, in that, in that first novel. Thomas is his actual name. And then, and then there's another son, too. And the reason Peter hasn't seen these two sons since they were really kids is that his, that his divorce from his wife has been so terribly, almost, almost, to, the, almost to the point of violence. Um, and his, his ex-wife has made 
perfectly clear that she does not want him and these um, other two boys' lives, and they have become estranged. There are parts of this book, uh, I mean, a large part of this book, at least in Peter's story, is about reckoning, uh, and Peter realizing that despite the fact that he has so many reasons to be proud of Will, now he has to deal with the fact that um, he has not fought for these other two sons of his. And what might be the penalty for that? Now, it seems to me you've just pitched a fourth novel, but I... <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what people are telling me. That, there's, your, there's your fourth novel. Because if Sully, Sully is gone, and you know, in the fourth novel, Peter, who's been trying so desperately to get out of North Bath, for all, for all of these years, he may very well have made his escape. But that house, by God, Miss Burl's house, Sully's yes. house, Peter's house, is still there. And now you've got um, Wacker, that is Thomas, and Will, who, um, are they both in the house? <laughs> you know? Um, and if you go forward um, 10 years, somebody said um, from spending a bit of time with Wacker, um, would, would, would he have attacked the Capitol? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. They're very different boys. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, they are. Um, so now I'm, I'm finding it, I'm finding it rather difficult now in, in view of, uh, in, in view of this conversation to say with any certainty that there won't be a fourth, uh, full novel. No. But, uh, I'm, I'm going to need... <laughs> I'm going, to, I'm going to need a bit more convincing. We'll, we'll, we'll talk some more. <laughs> well, you know, what I find fascinating is you and I spoke uh, maybe a week before the book came out. Mm -hmm. And you, you were much more committed to the idea of this being the final book. And, and your, uh, what you said uh, on the air at that point was, was that you, you know, you'd run out, run out of titles. And, then, and it, was, it was right then, and I thought, well, anybody's fool. Anybody's fool. Yeah. Or, or just fools. Yeah, <laughs> right. There is other low-hanging fruit. Uh, <laughs> I mean, even if you want a spinoff and just call it Whacker, I yeah. <laughs> am all for that. Well, and you know, the, one of the interesting things, um, um, I always knew that I was going to call the book Somebody's Fool because it was that perfect title, It's Low-Hanging Fruit. But the, the file that I created on my computer was not called Somebody's Fool. The file was called Inheritance. Oh. And that's what this book was about because it's, and it's not just Peter, it's also um, uh, police, uh, Chief Raymer, and it's also Janie and Ruth and Janie's daughter who, is, who has come into an enormous inheritance that she never expected to get, nor did anybody expect to get. Almost everybody in this book has inherited something. And it brings up, I, th I think more than anything thematically, it brings up what I really wanted to investigate in this book, is what do we all inherit in this life if we're fortunate enough to live long? And Peter, of course, has inherited Miss Burl's house, even that's what Sully always called it. He's inherited money from his father. His, here's a man who's never even owned a wallet, you know, and 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 uh, he's kept his money in a in a in a in a clip. Well, it turns out he's actually he's he he actually has some money. So Peter has inherited some wealth, and when he gets ready to sell Miss Burl's house, there'll be more. It will complete his escape. Except he's inherited more than that. He's also inherited a to-do list. Um, Sully has given him a list of people that he wants him to check up on, which Peter has been dutifully doing, but also kind of resentfully doing. And that list includes many of the people, if you've read any of the earlier books, you know who's on that list, right? Uh, Rub, first and foremost, is, is on that list. And so is Carl Roebuck and, you know, and... and, and and Janie and Ruth, but also, also Peter has um, um, uh, inherited that that other gift that keeps on giving, which is genetics. Because 
Every day he wakes up and looks at himself in the mirror in the morning, and every morning he looks a little, little bit more like his father than, than he did before. And if he didn't re recognize that himself, everybody that he meets on the street tells him just how much he looks, just how much he looks like his father. But it's not just Peter. Janie, for instance, has inherited her mother Ruth's diner, but she has also inherited some sort of gene. If she had a superpower, it would be to look out in a room this size with this many people in it, half of whom are men, and she would pick the worst man <laughs> in the room. Someone who will do to her what her now hus dead husband Roy used to do, which was beat the living out of her. So she has inherited that. Um, and her own daughter um, has inherited her grandfather's junk business, which nobody thought was worth anything, but turns out to be worth an enormous amount of money. But she also inherits a kind of genetic memory of trauma. I think we're, we're coming to learn now something about trauma that maybe a generation or two ago we really did not understand about trauma, which is that we can also inherit some of that kind of, in some sort of strange genetic way. We can, in, we can inherit trauma from our parents and, and, maybe, and maybe even our grandparents. And this poor girl who has inherited, she, she doesn't care about the money. She doesn't, incur, she doesn't care about this enormous wealth that she didn't expect to get. But in, in addition to the wealth, which should make everything right, she's also inherited this, this terrible trauma. So that's, that's why the book at one point, at least on my computer, was called Inheritance. Because that's, that's, you know, my last several books have been about destiny. Because it seems to me my own personal destiny, I never quite have understood how I have been so fortunate as to live the life that I, that I have. It, does, it doesn't make sense to me that things have worked out this way, and I've always kind of had the feeling that if I had 99 more tries, got born 99 more times to exactly the same circumstance that I was born to in Gloversville, New York in 1949, in my family, in that place, my suspicion has always been that the vast majority of those other lives would not have turned out well. And that, to me, is because, you know, part of destiny is, is what we're all fated to. It's our, our genetics. Uh, part of it is free will, those choices that we make. And have you ever noticed how when people are successful, they always want to explain their success in terms of free will? Well, I did this, and then I did this, and then I did this, and it all worked out, and here I am. A success, right? But but we all those of us those of us who are lucky enough to succeed in life always want to explain our success in terms of the decisions that we made, not in terms of fate, um, and also not in not in terms of just damn fool luck, which also plays a part. That 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 wheel spins, that wheel of fortune spins, and some of us are lucky and some of us, and some of us aren't. But those are the three prongs, it always seems to me, of, of, of destiny. And um, my own, the fact, that, the fact that I am sitting here with Joe and all of you wonderful people holding a microphone today, holding a microphone and talking about a literary career that just seems to me, even now when I look at it, so incredibly blessed. It just seems lucky, <laughs> blessed, um, and, and certainly not, um, not, not just a matter of, oh, I did this, that, and the other, and it all worked out. Page 316, rub. Peter spied him on a park bench halfway down the block with his head in his hands, a study in dejection. Next to him sat Carl Roebuck, who promised to hang around until Peter arrived and apparently kept his word. Unlike Rub, he seemed to be in excellent spirits, perhaps because it was a third person on the bench, his ex-wife, whose expression suggested that the last half hour of her life 
would not be the one she'd tell people about if asked to explain why life was worth living. <laughs> I would enter into evidence to counter your argument that yes, luck, but also great, great, great talent. Thank you. Um, let me say this about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> talent plays a part. What I'm thinking back to now is my graduate writing program um, at the University of Arizona. I did a number of degrees then. This was during Vietnam. We kept, we just kept taking degrees. <laughs> and so I did, I did my MA and I did a, um, uh, or I did my BA and an MA and a PhD and then went back for an MFA. That's when I was in a writing program. And I was in with the University of Arizona program at the time was very, very good, very, very competitive. And I was in with, um, with a bunch of writers. Um, and if you looked at that, that group of writers um, that I was a part of, and several of them did go on to, to, to have very substantial careers. But what I found, what I found interesting was that if you, if you gauged, if you were looking at, I don't know, what, you, what, what we normally think of as talent, I don't want to, you know, define the life out of it. Talent, promise, whatever, whatever you call that thing. I think um, that if my creative writing teachers were here and were asked who among that group they would have predicted would have had a writing career, I would have been very, I would have been very low on that list. Richard Russo's new novel is Somebody's Fool. It is published by Knopf. Rick, thank you so much. It's always a great pleasure to be with you, and thank you so much for spending time with us. Let's, let's do it again. Our thanks to our host, Northshire Bookstore, Northshire.com, and the Saratoga Performing Arts Center, SPAC.org. Many thanks to our producer, Sarah LaDuke. You can write to us at book at wamc.org. The latest on national productions programs is available via the Airwaves newsletter at wamc.org and on social media at wamcradio. Bookmark us for next week. <laughs>